Hi, I'm Ray Parker. I'm one of the teachers at Rincon First Christian Church. I teach the adult Sun School class. And I'm teaching the International Sun School series for summer quarter. And this is next to the last lesson for August 23rd in this quarter. And the title of this lesson is Taming the Tongue from James 3, 1 to 12. And this is a lesson that we all have problems with. We would probably all like to just skip this and uh, say we're all good. Uh, but since we all have a problem with it, uh, we'll, we need to look at it. And since, it is, since this is next to the last lesson in the quarter, uh, then let me go ahead and tell you that the books are in for next quarter. If you would like a Sun School book for the fall quarter, I will have them in the sanctuary uh, this coming Sunday. And uh, you may pick one up and uh, have them ready. Also, uh, since this is the end of the summer quarter and the kids are back in school, I hope that we will be back in Sunday school in person uh, come the 1st of September. I look forward to that, though that has not officially been stated yet. Uh, but uh, maybe we can be back in person for Sun Tzu uh, in the future. You've heard the, you've heard the phrase about sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But we know the power of words, don't we? We know the power to heal. We know the power to damage. And so it is very important that James gives to us this, this warning uh, about the words that we use. James's audience undoubtedly had problems with the tongue as we have problems with the tongue and the things that we say and the way that we say them. And so he gives these instructions since today's lesson draws on figures of speech, particularly metaphors, uh, he is very, very good at using illustrations in the form of metaphors and we would call short, short one or two sentence stories as means of explaining himself. And so uh, there's a whole series of these and these 12 verses that we're going to be looking at today. How we use our tongue reveals uh, the nature of the heart in relationship to motives connected with our speech and our actions. May we pray before we get into our lesson. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for this time that we can be together. We thank you that you give to us your word <clears throat> Uh, through James and through the other uh, writings uh, of your will for us. And we pray that through your Spirit and your Word you may draw us to a better uh, control of our tongue and of what we say and how we say it. In your Son's name, Amen. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers. Why do you think James here in this and in, in these instructions about the tongue specifically speech, speaks to teachers? If you remember uh, a lot of the interaction that Jesus had with the rabbis in his earthly ministry, we never see him condemning the normal people, most of his condemnation, most of his terse words were at those rabbis and those leaders because they were the ones who taught. And so here James is warning those, those Christians, the church, about 
really seeking status in the sense of being a rabbi, in the sense of being a teacher. And so he cautions them because, as he's going to say, greater condemnation is going to come, greater judgment is going to come to those who teach others and lead them astray, who teach others one thing and practice another thing, then judgment will be very severely for them. And this is, this, this is that caution, this is that warning for any of us who teach or preach or lead in some, some spoken way that we have to be careful that our walk and our talk fit together. And so he gives reason in 1B, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. This brings the word uh, to mind the words of Jesus in Matthew 12, 36 and 37 where He says, Everyone will have to give an account of the day of judgment for every empty word that they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Words are important to us. Verse 2. We're all, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check. Stumble. We stumble over words. No one is perfect in their speech, he indicates, and that is true. But the idea of stumbling at least gives us the idea that it is accidental because when we're walking out in, in the woods for instance we may we may catch our toe or our foot on a root or a limb or something in the path and we stumble and we may fall or we may catch ourselves but in that regard we stumble and so James says here that we all stumble in, in our in our speech but still we have to be be careful in it Teachers are responsible for what they pass along in biblical teaching. And this, this James's speech here, James's teaching here, is directed toward teachers, but this is true of anyone who calls themselves a Christian. We all have to be careful of what we say to others. This chapter 3 is a very pivotal uh, point for James. Uh, explicitly t connecting speech with activity or speech with lifestyle of the body. And so James is saying here to control the tongue, we're able to control the entire body. We are all, we, if we subject our tongue to wisdom, we subject our tongue to thought, we subject our tongue to God's uh, principles, then we can subject our whole body to those same type of principles. Power of the tongue. When we put bits into the mouth of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. So James begins here with three illustrations, three small metaphors. Uh, everyone in, in James's audience and even everyone in our audience today will understand these three illustrations. One with a horse, one with a ship, and one with a fire. Those are readily, easily understood uh, concepts and how small things can produce great effects. And this is here with the, with the horse. That small bridle, that, that little piece of metal that's put in the horse's mouth uh, doesn't necessarily hurt him, but it is a means of controlling that horse, whether it's to stop him or to make him go or to turn to the left or turn to the right is just in the hand in the hands of the, the person with the reins and so that big animal can be told by a much smaller person in that sense then the second illustration or take ships as an example although they are so large and are driven by strong winds they are steered by a very small rudder whenever the pilot wants to go the small rudder, that uh, 
whether it's a wheel in a larger ship or whether you're in a uh, fishing boat and you have that little rudder connected to the motorboat, uh, that rudder is what steers the ship right or left. And compared to the size of the ship, those, ru those rudders, those steering mechanisms are very small. And again, this is something that's easily understood in any culture that you would read this passage. 5a. Likewise, in a similar manner, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it, make great, it makes great boast. To ensure James's readers gets the message, he pauses here and sort of draws a, a, a quick conclusion. So like the rudder, like the bits, there's the tongue. It's small in our mouths, but my, my, what great boast it makes, and it causes us to get in problems. What's the old saying? We open mouth, insert foot. Sometimes we open mouth and insert both feet and both hands. And so, and so we understand that the tongue is such a powerful uh, part of our body. It causes a lot of problems. Verse 5b, consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Third illustration, one spark can reap havoc upon a forest, upon a community, upon really a nation. And so here that small spark is, is illustrated here. Proverbs 16, 27 says this, A scoundrel plots evil and his speech is a scorching fire. The tongue is also a fire, a whirl of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and itself is set on fire by hell. The tongue has an outsized effect. Three concepts here. First, it corrupts the whole body. It makes the whole person unholy by what is said, by the damage it does to others. Secondly, the whole course of one's life on fire. The tongue can upset the whole cycle of our ordered life. It just changes things in a moment that can, at times can't be repaired. And thirdly, itself is set on fire by hell. James gives the, the, the source of the abuse. Fires of hell, we're talking about Satan here. How much of our, of our uh, unwarranted speech is motivated by Satan? How often do we let him get into our mind and our heart? And uh, uh, when anger we say uh, hurtful things, and damaging things, destroying things with our tongues. And maybe if, if we were not so angry we would not have ever said those things. Are we frustrated or, or a whole number of things? And this is this idea that James has already talked about stumbling. We, we get caught up at times and we say things. And James says here, its source is a fire of hell. He goes on in a little bit different venue. All kinds of animals, birds and reptiles and sea creatures have been tamed and have been tamed by mankind. In Genesis 1.28, God gave to mankind the ability to rule over all creatures. And in that, in that, in that time span, man has brought many animals into uh, subjugation, uh, we have domesticated many types of animals and used for the good of mankind. Many dangerous animals have been 
in one sense tamed in zoos and circuses and that sort of thing to be used for man's entertainment. And so James says, man has had a very well control of the wild things. But man, we have a time controlling that little thing in our mouth, that tongue. And so he says in 8, But no human being can tame the tongue. It is restless evil, full of deadly poison. A circus. A man in the circus can take that long whip and control a lion or a tiger to jump from hoop to hoop or to uh, stand to stand and do what he, what he directs. We have a time taking a, a whip to our tongue, don't we? We like that old thing too good in our mouth. And so, James says here, we, we do a pretty good job of containing, uh, taming wild animals, but not so much with the tongue. James' word picture here of a deadly poison brings to mind Psalms 140, verse 3, the violent. Make their tongues as sharp as serpents, the poison of vipers on their lips. Poison of vipers. Think about the poison that spewed out of man's tongue. And we have so many, uh, so many platforms to do that today. We have all sorts of media that we can spew out damaging words to masses of people, not just one or two people, not just those close around us in a community. We can do it worldwide. And whether we can tweet it, or book it, or chat it, we have those avenues now that, that, that this, this poison and we, see, we have seen the poison that's been unleashed upon, a, upon the world in America in, in the last several months in this country. And it's deadly. It's destructive. It's destroying even the fabric of our great country. Verse 9. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Throughout this letter, James is concerned about the divided heart. And here, he says, at one moment, we can be singing and praising and praying to God. And the very next moment, we can be cursing one another. How true this is for us. We know that is the case so often times in our own lives. Jesus, quote, Jesus uh, quotes Isaiah 29, 13 and Matthew 6, 18 when He says, These people come near to Me with their mouth and honor Me with their lips, but their hearts are far from Me. Isn't that the case so often times with us as Christians? We do a decent job of praising and singing and praying and, and honoring God. And then the next few moments or the next day, we're ranting and raving about somebody else. The Indians have been, uh, have been said, created the thing, you speak with fork and tongue, whether they ever said that or not. Uh, it's true, isn't it? Oftentimes we speak, uh, what's another phrase, we speak out of both sides of our mouth. And so, uh, the, the tongue is a wild of evil. Verse 10, Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Have I just mentioned social media? It doesn't have to be person to person. Our, our fingers uh, can can type those messages faster than sometimes our our tongue can say them. 
And yet they came from the source. They come from my heart. They come from my mind. They come from my being. And those, those words destroy and hurt. He gives another illustration here in verse 11. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? This is one of those rhetorical questions. And the rhetorical question demands a no, it shouldn't answer. We know better. We know that that a, uh, a, a, a fountain can't spew out both kinds of water at the same time. Now, it may be polluted, but James is talking about the fact of this fountain is flowing one moment, uh, good water the next moment, it's flowing uh, poisonous water, and James says that's not the case. And it shouldn't be the case with our tongues either. This application is it's impossible to to miss whether it is we who listen today or those who listened 2,000 years ago. Then the last verse, My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can salt spring produce fresh water. This last illustration is one that can't be missed as well. We know better. Those things don't happen naturally. Those things don't happen in nature. And those things should not happen in our lives as well. So we have to be very careful whether we are teachers, like I am, or whether we are uh, pew sitters. We have to be careful of the words that we, we speak. Today's lesson concerns the destructive power of the tongue. Specifically, it deals with the words spoken by those who would recognize as teachers of the first century church. Are those inspired to be a teacher, uh, whether it's the first century church or the church today? The work of taming the tongue is a lifelong task. It starts when we're born. It ends when we take our last breath. We must be always conscious are the things that we say, and sometimes the tone in which we say them. It calls for all of us as Christians to examine ourselves, to examine our speech, and let our speech be guided by what God wants us to speak. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank You. We know we fall short of this mandate we know that there are so many times in all of our lives that we just, we're just wrong. Help us, Father, to repent. Help us to see where we are wrong and make a course change, a correction, that we might be pleasing to You. In Jesus I pray. Amen.